I'm very impressed by the number of people that have shown up for the first annual meeting here, hopefully. I was telling you uh, all about this. And the first seed meeting uh, that uh, was held in this country, five people were in the meeting. So now we have 30, 40 people here. And hopefully this will continue uh, for a long, long time as we go along. <coughs> Uh, Dr. Hill uh, gave a fantastic presentation and really set the stage for a lot of the stuff that uh, I have slides on, so I will be uh, going through those uh, uh, much faster. And uh, here are some of the objectives uh, that we're going to go through. Uh, let me uh, uh, make sure that you know that I'm now I'm talking about individual patients that already have heart failure. So they have established heart failure, and now we're going to go over the prevalence of sleep apnea in this population. Uh, so we started this quite some time ago, and uh, we really looked at uh, 100 uh, veterans uh, <coughs> patients with, with, uh, with HEFREF. So it's heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Dr. Hitt was talking about HEFREF and HEFREF, so we're talking right now about HEFREF. Uh, these are individuals with diminished ejection fraction, the ejection fraction. So anyway, these were uh, 100 uh, veterans that we had a grant. We uh, brought them into the laboratory, and uh, yeah, this thing it jumps around here. Brought to the laboratory and did sleep study on them, and uh, for the first time we noticed that 50% of these patients have an AHR of 50 or more per hour. Now remember, less than five considered normal. And 49% had moderate to severe sleep apnea. And again, these are consecutive patients, virtually 100 out of 114. Uh, so no selection here. However, only 10% of our patients were beta blocker at the time. So really the question has come up in the literature uh, that if uh, you have now beta blocker as a, a therapeutic agent for heart failure, has the prevalence of sleep apnea changed? So here are a number of studies from all over the world, and uh, you can see N down here, this is our own study at the beginning. This is the percent with AHI of 15 or more per hour, and uh, this is the beta blocker, 10% in our study, but look, the other studies have uh, beta blockers, 80 to 100%. The studies are from Germany, uh, United Kingdom, Canada, and I don't have other studies, China, Portugal, and you can see, look at that. This is our study, 49%. Wow, 54% of the patients with heart failure, HEFREF, have significant sleep apnea. So this is really a huge number. And again, remember, there are beta blockers, and these are consecutive patients. So when I put them all together, and here we go, these are uh, prevalence of sleep apnea with this AHI in consecutive HEFREF patients. Very important, consecutive. So no question asked if you have sleep apnea, you snore, None of those questions. And 54% have an AHI of 15 more per hour. And then the phenotype uh, depends on uh, how you classify your hypopneas. If the hypopneas are more attractive, you will see more OSA. If the hypopneas are more central, you see more central. So this phenotype really depends on the classification of the hypopneas. And again, the number here is 54%. Dr. Hill talked about HEFPEF. And this is a very important study by cardiologists from Germany. And again, these are 244 consecutive patients with FF. They have right heart catheterization, they have echo, the whole thing. These are cardiologists that have done the study of pedial heart failure. And uh, as you can see here, 48% of these patients also have significant sleep apnea. You put them all together, uh, HEFPEF and HEFREF, you again, we're talking about 52 to 48%, 50% of these consecutive patients with very significant sleep apnea. Now, uh, there has been an update on the prevalence of sleep apnea in this country, uh, and this is the updated study that was published recently. This is the updated Wisconsin sleep cohort study. So now the prevalence of sleep apnea has gone up in this country, uh, and now we're talking about 17% of men and 9% of women have an AHI of 15 or more per hour. So this is a significant change since the earlier study in the New of Medicine. So uh, if you think about heart failure, now we talk about 50% having significant sleep apnea. So there is really a major uh, risk factor for sleep, heart failure is a major risk factor for sleep apnea 
based on this kind of data. And when you look at the, the, the burden of heart failure, and this is from circulation just 2014, uh, currently in the US, we're talking about 6 million people having heart failure. This would be both HEFREF and HEFREF together now. We, we can't tell here. It is estimated that uh, hopefully when uh, we are allowed in 2030, we're talking about 10 million people with heart failure. And again, if our indication suggests who's up about the pregnancy is correct, 5 million people with heart failure have very significant sleep apnea. And virtually 99% of them are undiagnosed. 99% are undiagnosed. And again, heart failure is a disorder of all the population. And if you look at the cost, the estimated cost in 2012 was $38 billion. $38 billion. So, uh, the, uh, the, the visits to the hospital and the emergency rooms are really incredible. That $38 billion is, uh, is a huge amount of money. And so, how often actually uh, Medicare uh, patients, uh, beneficiaries, are diagnosed with heart failure? This is uh, when we looked at a number of these patients with a newly diagnosed heart failure, only 2% were sent for a single study. Out of the 31,000, only 2% were sent for a single study. Again, almost 15,000 of those patients should have significant sleep apnea. And we think all of them should have a sleep study because it's a major risk factor. 50%, one out of two, have significant sleep apnea. Uh, and you're not surprised that out of the uh, 572, all of them were diagnosed with sleep apnea. So if you already have a suspicion that you have sleep apnea, uh, then you test the patient with heart failure, you will not be disappointed. And why is it that it is so underdiagnosed? And this is the mystery. Uh, these patients are not sleeping. When I was doing my studies, uh, everything was holding. The sleep studies were holding. And after I uh, decoded the whole thing, I had taken a very good history from them. Uh, and this is what I found. Uh, if you look at the prevalence of excessive daytime sleepiness, this is the group without sleep apnea, this is the group with CSA, this is the group with OSA. So there is no significant difference in these people telling me that they were sleeping. So, don't think they didn't have significant sleep apnea. The AHR was two here, 48, 32. So in spite of very significant sleep apnea, there was no differentiation in terms of the excessive daytime sleepers. So the effort is simply useless in patients with heart failure. Uh, the phenomenon here is very interesting. Even though the effort is uh, negative, look here, uh, patients with heart failure, we don't not say central sleep apnea in this case, even though the airport is uh, not showing it, if you do MSLT arm, they are very sleepy. And here you can see the result of the MSLT. The ones with central sleep apnea in this case had an MSLT of four minutes. So pathologically sleepy, objectively, and subjectively, there is a disconnect. In fact, in this particular study, uh, there was a correlation between the MSLT and the AHI. And I think this has a major impact on patients with heart failure. Not only uh, there is underdiagnosis by cardiologists, but also if they are not sleepy and they don't feel any better with the machine, they're not going to be very adherent to the machine. Remember, the most important factor for really adherence is excessive daytime sleepiness in multiple studies. Not all, but multiple studies. If you're sleepy, if you see CPAP, you're not sleepy the next day, I love it. I'm going to use the device. Dr. Hill again talked about uh, uh, these consequences of, of sleep apnea. And let me indicate that the consequences are qualitatively similar between the CSA and OSA, although there is a qualitative difference. And again, he uh, uh, talked about the oxidative stress, inflammation, and so on and so forth. Uh, and the theming, BNP, uh, but I'm going to uh, concentrate on a couple of things here, uh, mostly hospitalization and mortality. So mortality, readmission, and that's the treatment matter. Uh, okay, the, the admission to the hospital is a critical issue now. As you know, Medicare started in 2012, uh, punishing <coughs> hospitals for excess readmission of heart failure, beginning with 2% of all the payments. 
and it's going to be up to 4%, and I bet you it's going to keep going up if the admission uh, is excessive for heart failure. And this study is from uh, Columbus cardiology people there, and uh, they uh, corrected for a number of co-founders here, and OSA in heifer patients was a significant factor for readmission to the hospital. What about mortality? Here is a study uh, from uh, Canada, and you can see survival over the y-axis, and follow up on the x, you can see uh, patients without significant sleep apnea, AHR of 7, compared to patients with significant sleep apnea, AHR of 33. This is always said we're talking about. Look at the hazard ratio. If you have obstructive sleep apnea with heart failure, the chances of excess death is three times as much compared to those who do not have significant sleep apnea. <coughs> These are the confounding factors that were taken into account. And then I can show you multiple studies showing the same thing. This is a European study, people with heart rest, uh, low sleep, significant sleep apnea, central and distracted sleep apnea, excess mortality. And again, I can go on and on with these uh, observational studies. The problem with observational studies, of course, uh, is that if you are, uh, in, in terms of the treatment, if you're not uh, adhering to your treatment, you may not be adhering to your other therapies. So there's going to be a little problem when I go to, to the treatment of this. But let, let me show you something very interesting, and this is again shown repeatedly. This is the study of OSA in general population. This is the study uh, that uh, was published quite some time ago in Denver, the E and Krieger group. So this is the group treated with CPAP, and uh, this is the group that uh, uh, refused therapy. Look at the slope of the mortality. Uh, this is years, six, seven years. Uh, so suddenly, people start to, to drop out, unfortunately. If you look at people with heart failure, look at the slope of the line. It is really, very, very acute. So if you have heart failure, you have sleep apnea, the slope of death, as you can see, again, it's, it's pretty acute. Again, this is not emphasized in literature, but just look at what's happening. <coughs> this, is, this is the other uh, study from, from, uh, from uh, Wisconsin, again, look. The, 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 this is this is uh, years over here. This is these are people with OSA and uh, AHI of more than 30. So it takes many many years before the waterfall of death, as I call it. So it's about 10 years. And if you have heart failure, boom, 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 from the beginning, the mortality is, is really uh, increasing. So very important point. That is why the threshold to treat sleep apnea is much lower in a patient with cardiovascular disease than a patient without cardiovascular disease. It really takes 10 years without, a pre, uh, without having a cardiovascular disease. It takes several years for this night after night, I would say, to finally kill the patient. And unfortunately, if you have heart failure, the whole game is different. So the threshold should be, should be completely different. All right, so the treatment of, of sleep apnea and heart failure in general, again, Dr. Hill talked about the uh, fluids, so I'm not going to emphasize that. Uh, uh, you know, opioids, uh, we'll have a lecture on the opioids later on, a very important topic. Viagra may also promote contractive sleep apnea, and I know that many in uh, Alaska don't need that, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> patients with contractive sleep apnea. If they take Viagra, they obstruct the sleep apnea, they get worse. I know that patients don't take it. Uh, if they have obstructive sleep apnea, they come back a month later. So what's going on, doctor? I took it, and some of them say it was worth it. So <laughs> <laughs> cessation of the smoke. We recently looked at this, uh, at, at our study, uh, and this is a very important point. If you take care of patients with really obstructive sleep apnea or heart failure, if they smoke. The odds ratio really goes up tremendously for having arrhythmias. That is because nicotine, nicotine in the smoke, stimulates the body, body increases sympathetic activity. And as Dr. Heath was talking about, a lot of patients with obstructive sleep apnea, or central sleep apnea, or heart failure have already increased sympathetic activity. So with nicotine yet mixed with sleep apnea, it's a bad, bad, bad mix. So please take a moment and talk about cessation of smoking in your patients with either OSA or heart failure. These are people with already high sympathetic activity. Okay, now, of course, there are multiple uh, uh, modalities of therapy for obstructive sleep apnea, but I'm gonna talk about uh, uh, the, the positive pressure devices, and 
Yeah, many more presidents uh, need uh, to be on the seat. only four. <laughs> now, I, I do want to show you randomized clinical trials, double blind randomized clinical trials. And fortunately, we don't have uh, a, a lot of those. But it is very important to look at the you know, double blind randomized clinical trials <laughs> because we don't know what the patient is doing and the patient doesn't know what she is doing. Now, this is our problem. We do not have RCTs. What we have are observational studies. And again, remember, with the observational study, if you don't use your CPAP, it's a behavioral thing, maybe you don't use your cholesterol medication, if you don't use your beta blocker, that is always a problem with observational studies. Having said that, let's look at the mortality of OSA in heart failure. OSA in heart failure. So this is a Japanese study, and you can see uh, uh, this is the, uh, the uh, cumulative free survival, which is readmission and mortality together. And you can compare patients with uh, uh, sleep apnea 45 per hour that did not, that were treated with CPAP, and the other that, um, that were not treated. They, were, they, they refused CPAP. So you can see the difference in mortality. Look at the hazard ratio, about two. This is a very important issue I want to emphasize. Look at the 65 patients on CPAP. Look what happens. So I'm breaking down now. So 32. <coughs> 32 and 33 is 65. So this is the group that you see CPAP. But look, this is the group that you see CPAP more than six hours. This is the group that you see CPAP three and a half hours. Big difference. You don't use your CPAP, you're not going to see the benefit of, of survival, of the admission. It's like beta blocker. You don't use your beta blocker, you're not going to see the benefit of the beta blocker. And again, these patients are not sleeping to begin with. For them to use the CPAP, we got to show them these kind of curves. And with my patients in heart failure, I am showing you these curves. Ahead of time, I tell them, I know you're not sleepy. I know you're not going to should benefit from CPAP. And look, this is for your heart. You're going to be uh, using your CPAP. This is the kind of survival that has been shown. And that's the one that have not used the CPAP. So this is a very important point in terms of taking care of the patients with heart failure that we, a, a, a sleep physician, should be sitting down with them, talking with them ahead of time, you know, what is going on, uh, and, and therefore, hopefully, they, 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 they remain more compliant with the use of CPAP. This is the study that I was telling you about with the, with the Medicare patients. So the 2% uh, were diagnosed with sleep apnea, 295 were treated with CPAP, and a few with oxygen. Look what happened with survival. This is a survival of, uh, 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 the next two years, eight, eight months here, this is the group that was tested, diagnosed, and treated. Two years survival and mortality was about 10%. This is the other 30,000 that they were never tested, 30% dead in two years. This was corrected for a number of co-founders. So uh, if you have always a heart failure, if you treat it, observational studies suggest that uh, survival improves. But again, compliance is a very important issue when you talk to the patient about compliance. These are not sick patients, they're not seeing acute benefit, only long term. Now, when we talk about readmission, again, this is a very important issue, uh, and uh, this was uh, recently uh, published, this suggested, and uh, you may have seen that article, but when I, when I looked at uh, 630 patients in this cohort, yeah, there was 130 in this cohort that were suspected to have sleep apnea, but they were never tested. And when I looked at the mortality and hospitalization of the two groups, this is what I found. So here we go. Uh, mortality compared together, 829. Hospitalization, 74 versus 91%. And when I calculated all the costs, including PSG, uh, CPAP, and so on and so forth, Medicare would have benefited $12 million out of the 630 patients in this, uh, uh, in this cohort. Okay. Now, that was OSA. Now I'm going to look at the CSA. And again, I'm going to be discussing the same issue. Mortality and mission as a little matter. Uh, we looked at our heart failure patient at the VA. This is half of patients. And um, there were 32 with uh, AHI of 2 and 56 with AHI of more than 5, mean 34, but these are patients with central sleep apnea. 
So that central apnea index was 23 out of 34. So really, these are central sleep apnea <coughs> patients. And very interestingly, if you look at the survival, you can see this is the ones with the last significant sleep apnea, this is the group with significant sleep apnea, and the hazard ratio, again, two. And there are 24 variables in this analysis that I have accounted for. Projection fractions, blood pressures, so on and so forth. So it's a very detailed study of the Shinjak. And uh, again, the hazard ratio is two if you have simple CPAP. Very similar in OSA if you have OSA and heart failure. More or less the same hazard ratio. Again, uh, the philosophy approach is, uh, is more or less the same. Uh, there are some major differences, of course. Uh, we have uh, used azazolamide, we used Tiafil, we used oxygen. We are not conducting a study in the US uh, uh, in the other 48 ones with frenic nerve stimulation. But uh, I will primarily talk about uh, CPAP and, uh, and other possible pressures. And here is a big difference between CPAP responses of CSA patients versus CPAP response of the OSA patients in heart failure. And uh, this is what we found quite some time ago, that uh, when you talk about CSA, a large number of the patients do not respond to CPAP the first night. So in this particular study, 43% responded. AHI decreased from 36 to 4, compared to the other group, which AHI did not decrease. So we found 57% CSA non-responsiveness. And this is an example of a patient with the uh, hunter cherry stop screening, uh, uh, beautiful, as you can see, central apneas, crescendo, decrescendo. And this patient got CPAP of 6, we went up to 7, 8, 9, 10, CPAP did not help 57% of the patients. And uh, then came the Canadian trial that was published in the New York Medicine and a post hoc analysis which found this. Uh, if patients responded to CPAP, again, this is central CPAP, yeah, and there were 57 patients out of 100 that responded to CPAP in this group. The AHI decreased from 40 per hour to 6.5 per hour. So they responded to CPAP. And look at their survival compared to the control group. So the control group, AHI about 40 per hour, but uh, no CPAP therapy, of course. So when they respond to CPAP, their survival improves significantly. A post hoc analysis. However, if they do not respond to CPAP, it's going to be a different story. So this is the CPAP responding, responsive patients. This is the control we have seen. And that is the group that not, did not respond to CPAP. So in fact, uh, the group that uh, did not respond to CPAP, they had a little bit worse mortality even compared to control. And what percentage did not respond to CPAP? Look, 57 responded to CPAP, 43 did not respond to CPAP. So we found that on the first night, 57% did not respond to CPAP. At three months, it's about 43%. So there's a little bit of responsiveness over time to CPAP, and you don't want to run the risk of having excess mortality. So in, in our opinion, patients with heart failure and central CPAP, if that first night on CPAP, the AHI does not go below 15 per hour, which is what we consider responsiveness, the patient will not go home with CPAP. Because if they do, uh, this kind of mortality, and Dr. Hill said it correctly, a lot of lawyers are interested in this kind of thing. So we do not send anybody home with heart failure, either half or half ref with central CPAP, you know, non-responsive to CPAP, just the first night. What do I do? What do I tell them? They're waiting for me in the sleep laboratory until I look at the sleep study and I determine whether there is a, a drop in AHI for the whole night. It's not a sleep study, heart failure patient organ split. This is just one night, full night of study. And in the morning, the whole AHI I'm looking at, if it's less than 15, patient, I show the study to the patient, I say, look, this was yours before, this is now, this is the CPAP, you go home with this, I know you're not going to be less sleep, but you're doing this for your heart, this is the mortality data on CPAP. Or not. If the patient, however, is, 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 is falling to this category, uh, the patient will come back for another study, which I'm going to go over with you right now. So, 
But we're talking about, again, 43% uh, responsive uh, the first night, 57% non-responsive the first night. You have CPAP for three months, you get about 57% uh, responsiveness. And 43% remain non-responsive. So what do I do for the remaining CSA patients who are CPAP non-responsive? Adaptive thermal ventilation. How many of you have used ASV? Wow, that's impressive. That's impressive. Uh, as you know, there are globally uh, three, uh, three ASV devices. Uh, these are the two ones in the United States. Respironics makes one, Respet makes one. These are very, very different uh, devices. And uh, uh, you really need to know the algorithm of, of these devices uh, pretty well. But let me just uh, talk to you right here. Uh, these ASV devices, for those of you who uh, are not familiar with this, uh, they have variable inspiratory pressure support. We we'll talk about that in a moment. They have a backup rate, and they have auto CPAP. So auto CPAP eliminates attracting events. There's a backup rate if there's an impending apnea, and then the variable inspiratory pressure support. Remember, the inspiratory pressure support, if you think about the high level, is the pressure uh, difference between inspiration and expiration. So in this case, uh, say 16 here, 10 here, so the pressure support is about six centimeter of water. Fixed inspiratory pressure support with high level. With the ASD devices, it's a different ballgame. So uh, if the patient has uh, uh, this kind of breathing pattern, uh, like chain of breathing, uh, the, the patient is hyperpnic here, hypopnic here, the cyclic goes up and down. The device is anti-cyclic. It's anti-cyclic. What do I mean by that? Well, when the patient is breathing excessively, the inspiratory pressure support is going down. When the patient is having hypopnea, the inspiratory pressure support will go up. So really, it is an anti-cyclic uh, kind of uh, augmenting ventilation when the patient is hypoventilating, uh, withdrawing support when the patient is hyperventilating. So you can see this may be more comparable in the long run for these patients who are not sleeping to begin with. And we hope that this will be the case. And if you want a, a real life story of that, uh, you can see here, this is a patient again with the hypopneas up and down. This is the device output. You can see inspiratory pressure support goes up here, drops, goes up, drops. Now, we wrote two articles just published in CHEST on the algorithms of these devices, the September issue, uh, the August and September issue. The August issue deals with the algorithm of these devices, which really took me about two years to figure out how these devices are working. So if you're interested, Please look at the, those articles. Technicians should really look at those articles in terms of the algorithms. And the second one is on clinical application, uh, which uh, is one of them is heart failure, which we're talking about here. So here we go. Uh, the components of ASV devices are uh, auto impact for extractive events, pressure support for periodic reading, and then the, uh, the backup rate for, for, for sleep apnea. You add them all together, you have adaptive cerebral ventilation. They are adaptive in the sense that they adapt to the patient's breathing pattern. It's a cerebral mechanism, negative feedback, so that's what is called adaptive cerebral ventilation. And uh, here is one of the patients I showed you on CPAP, they respond. Look at that on, on, on an ASV device. Uh, a very beautiful uh, control of the, of the CPAP. Yeah. We had all the studies in the literature in this meta-analysis that Sharma is the first author. Uh, and we compared uh, 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 ASV patients uh, to control group, which could be oxygen, could be CPAP, could be by level, or could be nothing, and all with heart failure. And indeed, uh, uh, ASV uh, did a much, much better job. Just concentrate over the crossover studies here. Uh, there were uh, uh, a number of patients uh, uh, that uh, had both. So you can see the AHI uh, dropped from 51 to 6 with ASD, with the other devices 50 to 21. So big difference. ASD is really very effective in, uh, in uh, treating CPAP and heart failure. Okay, what do we have with ASD and heart failure? And here is a study of um, uh, patients with HFREF. It's from Japan. Now, the studies I'm going to show you, not from the United States, for central CPAP. We have difficult time with our cardiologists. Very difficult. And uh, 
there are multiple reasons for this. Uh, I have discussed this several ways, several several uh, several papers in literature, and uh, there is no incentive for them. They have not been educated about it, and it goes on and on and on as to why only two percent of their patients are setting for sleep study, where all of them should have a sleep study. Fifty percent of them have sleep apnea. What is what is the greatest risk factor? So uh, uh, most of the studies I'm going to show you are from outside the country, unfortunately. Uh, here is again a Japanese study. You can see uh, those that stay on ASD versus those that refuse ASD. So big difference in, in, in mortality. This is the largest study we have so far, an observational study from Germany. And you see these patients with severe heart failure, with severe sleep apnea. AHI is about 50 here. And they are on beta blockers compared to uh, the other group uh, with an AHR 42 that refused ASD. Again, observational studies uh, remove the caveat. And if you look at the differences in survival, uh, look at the hazard ratio, how an ASD protects you, uh, the, your patient from, from, from death. This is another Japanese study, and this is the only randomized control trial on ASD. And uh, uh, this is half patients with, uh, with the sleep apnea. And uh, again, as Dr. Nick uh, uh, mentioned, these people have a relative preservation fraction, but their wedge pressure is elevated, and so on and so forth. And uh, there were 18 patients in the ASP group, randomized, and then the other 18 are in control. And it is very interesting that in spite of the small number of patients, there's a big difference in in survival. Uh, really too good to believe. We really need a much larger study, I, I think. Uh, and, and there are two randomized profiles right now going on. And uh, I talked about OSA and heart failure readmission. This is CSA uh, for readmission. And you can see uh, again from, from Congress, this is the heart failure hospital. Uh, the one month readmission for CSA was one and a half times in heart failure patients compared to those without central sleep apnea which has stayed the same after six months, 1.5. These are the covariates down here that they looked at. Uh, another Japanese study, and uh, uh, the same thing. Here we have two groups of patients with severe sleep apnea, AHR is 38. The group that uh, were treated, was treated with, with ASD, the group that refused ASD. Now, the, 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 the follow-up is down here. The core primary endpoint was death by free admission, but nobody died in this study, so it's all readmission. You can see there's a big difference in readmission between the two groups. Even in the other cases, you can see HI 16, HI 14, ASV improves readmission to the hospital. So again, uh, uh, this readmission issue is a very important thing. Uh, in, in Cincinnati, at the University of Cincinnati uh, Hospital, uh, each readmission is about ten to fifteen thousand dollars, about four to five days. Uh, like what I said, it, it, we're talking about large number of patients with heart failure. Fifty percent of them have AHI of fifteen or more per hour, and we think, as I mentioned, the readmission goes down and the mortality improves. But they need to be compliant with the device. They need to be compliant with the device. Uh, the cost thirty one billion dollars. And when you think about PSG and ASV or CPAP, it is very cost effective in terms of cutting down the readmission uh, to the hospital. Uh, you know that uh, uh, when you look at the mortality uh, and uh, some other cardiovascular problems, uh, we are prone to have those between 6 a.m. to 12 noon. So in this particular study, uh, noon is here. We are looking at patients with OSA and patients without OSA, and some with heart failure. You can see that uh, if you look at the 6 a.m. to 12 noon, most of the people uh, will, will, will die between 6 a.m. to 12 noon. However, this circadian pattern will change if someone has sleep apnea. So if you look at now midnight to 6 a.m., uh, this is the group with sleep apnea, this is the group without sleep apnea. So sleep is peaceful if you do not have sleep apnea, but sleep is not so well, peaceful if, if you have sleep apnea. Of course, when we tell the story to our patients, this is uh, 
this is what we hear. <laughs> <laughs> there are two RCTs going on with ASV devices, and if uh, Dr. Raymond invites me two years from now, I'll tell you about them. But at this point, we don't have much information. The first one has been completed, recruitment is done, and the data will be out actually in about 15 months or so. Our, well, uh, thank you so much for your attention, and if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. central and obstructive sleep apnea, and they are sur have surgery done for the obstructive sleep apnea, uh, or for the central, uh, yeah, for the obstructive sleep apnea, and afterwards they had sleep studies which are negative or normal. Is there any reason I'm sorry, for I that? I'm sorry, I could not hear you. After somebody has had obstructive sleep apnea and mixed central and obstructive sleep apnea, and they've had the obstructive part surgerized, then they have sleep studies done which are negative or a sleep apnea of any kind. Is there a reason for that? Could it, is it a false negative? No, I think the reason for that was that uh, whoever looked at sleep study did not a good job. <laughs> Which one? The first one? Or the... Good question. The first one. You know what the answer is. What, what, what the problem is. The search ones were really attractive events. That's what was going on. Normally, normally, Patients who have obstructive sleep apnea who either get tracheostomy or they go on CPAP, a percentage of them will develop central sleep apnea, which will go away with time. The so called uh, uh, emergent treatment, emergent central sleep apnea. So, in general population, that's about 4 or 5% in, in our population. In heart failure, it's about 15% who develop CPAP, emergent central sleep so it is really the other way around, exactly opposite of what you said. What you really were saying is that the very important issue to differentiate between obstructive and central sleep apnea on initial polysomnography. That is a very key thing. I can tell you that I go over this with my technicians many, many times. Errors continue to occur. I normally would increase the amplitude of the thraco abdominal excursions the amplitude of the temperature probe, the amplitude of the pressure probe. And in order to call it central apnea, four channels must be flat. Boom, 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 flat. I ignore the, recommended, the, the guidelines of the American Academy that 90% that 90, 90 drop, it should be 100% drop in order to minimize contamination between OSA and CSA. This is a very key issue here to really uh, talk about accurate diagnosis, differentiation of these two events from each other. It is worse with hypotenuse. You can imagine. It's worse with hypotenuse. Uh, but uh, th that is a very key thing. So afterwards, they won't need treatment? I'm oh, sorry? After they have negative studies, they wouldn't need treatment? No, if the patient is doing well and the study is negative, they match each other. I don't need that, right? Uh, if the study is negative, the patient will not. With regard to the use of uh, CPAP versus ASP, if you look at the hand tap post op analysis you showed, clearly there are some responders to CPAP very well. Right. On the other hand, you can pull out other studies that suggest, on average, ASD does better than CPAP in the population. So, do you recommend that people start off on CPAP and they're not responding to the ASD, or do you just start with the ASD? Right. Uh, uh, short of the upcoming two RCTs, uh, I will go with CPAP first because that is really the only, given that it's post hoc as a randomized profile that show increased survival with, with CPAP. Uh, so that's number one. And it's cheaper, of course, uh, to go that way. So in that second article uh, uh, that uh, is in our September issue of Chess, I go over the price differences. There's a big price difference. Uh, uh, so yeah, I mean, at this time, I think I'm going with, with the CPAP. The caveat uh, is that in, in that trial that you were referring to, at one year, 
the adherence to CPAP was 3.4 hours. Now, if the ASV studies show a much better adherence, then I think you can make a case to go with ASV based on that. Second of all, as you well know, and you indicated that, uh, uh, especially in the population with heart failure, when the phenotype of the disorder may change with time, as the heart failure gets worse, as blue retention occurs, and you indicated your attractive component will come up, uh, medications change, and so on and so forth, ASV devices are really adaptive to these changing phenotypes of the sleep apnea. So I think in the long run, for, for those reasons, it may be uh, you know, the, the, the way to go. And I think we should wait for the, for the trial that's coming up to, to, to show that better survival, better adherence, and so on and so forth. Do I make sense? Uh, yes, please. Uh, yeah, could you address uh, just the uh, AutoPAP? Uh, it's very popular, and when it comes to central sleep apnea, my experience has been bad, bad news when it comes to central sleep apnea and the auto CPAP, not the ADEPT ASP. I am glad you brought it up. Uh, I don't know if you saw the slides that I have. So uh, that, that is uh, exactly right. Uh, there are two things I instruct my technicians uh, overnight. Uh, they will not use either by level or auto PAP for patients with, uh, with central sleep apnea uh, for, for a number of reasons, for a number of reasons. Uh, 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 these devices are, are, you've got to be very careful about these devices. Uh, in fact, it's a study uh, that was published in ERJ. In this study, this uh, Belgian doctor, a very famous Belgian doctor, got several individuals who did not have sleep apnea. They gave them auto CPAP. In some of these people who are normal, the auto CPAP goes on to 20 centimeters of water. And a lot of times, as the pressure increases, reflexes that occur will induce central sleep apnea. Uh, so I think we should be very careful about use of uh, auto CPAP in general. Uh, for even for OSA, I always set a limit for them. I don't let the machine 4 to 20. That's a major mistake in my judgment because they react to high facts. They can do central sleep apnea. Uh, so, right. The same with the body level. With the body level, you're going to increase the ventilation to the patient, the PCO2 may drop, and you may have uh, the PCO2 may approach apnea threshold, so you may have more central apneas. So I think for patients with central sleep apnea, neither auto nor by level is appropriate therapy. Did that answer your question? Absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm so yes. in heart failure? Right. Uh, there is one study that, uh, by the dentist that used mandibular devices for heart failure and showed some improvement. There is a study that's going on right now for central sleep apnea with mandibular device. Uh, however, I, if you heard me, uh, what I was saying uh, uh, was that, uh, that uh, in general, most of us in, in the research arena with cardiovascular disease, we feel that our threshold for treatment of sleep apnea is actually lower for patients with cardiovascular disease than otherwise, which is why Medicare, for example, if you have hypertension, index of five or more, they give the machine. Otherwise, it's 15 or more. So given the differences in uh, efficacy between devices Positive pressure devices versus the mandibular devices, we normally recommend uh, the, the positive pressure devices. However, the studies 
should be pending to see if the combination may be effective or even by itself may be effective. That, in the, in the context of heart failure, you have only one single study. One single study. All right, thank you so much.